Tonin therapy, this is absolutely fabulous stuff as well, and you've so much to share with us, and our audiences are just excited to hear from it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the reason I uh, was so interested in what Todd was describing is because we also, of course, work with color and light. And we use the Denshaw filters. We, I've been working on this for, gosh, since 1975. And uh, we find that the Denshaw filters work very well with the color applications. But I was also interested in the idea of using laser beams uh, to make these light uh, commutations to transform uh, biological materials down at the molecular level. Uh, we're looking forward to the day that perhaps we can do holographic laser technology here at the healing center so that we can actually recreate the cymatic images that we're making three-dimensionally in the room over the patient while they're being treated with the sound, light, and color. Because if you could build these three-dimensional structures, which I've seen done, uh, with the sacred geometry, with the sound and light vibrating uh, in synchr uh, synchronicity, then just imagine the healing effects that would be possible if you could actually place the color, light, geometry on the person with the sound. Anyway, I do have a PowerPoint, and I'm going to see if I can get that working. I'll probably need Garav's help. Uh, for Energy Medicine Exchange today, I'm going to do the old school approach and mostly read what I say because I have found that unless I write things down and uh, stick to the script, I tend to veer away quite far. The title is Sonotherapy Healing with Light, Color, Sound, Water, and Subtle Energies. And I'm speaking from our Steamboat Healing Center here in Reno, Nevada. And I hope some of our people may check us out and perhaps come for a visit. Sound and vibrational healing has a long history, an understanding that extends back to the ancient Sumerians, Chinese, Chaldeans, Indians, Egyptians, Greeks, Uyghurs, Polynesians, Celts, Native Americans, et al., and certainly to the lost civilizations of legend such as Australasia, Atlantis, Lemuria, South Africa, etc. Sound therapy was common among the ancient Greeks. Pythagoras and his successors taught and employed sound therapy. Music and sound therapy were a common practice in the temples of Asclepius using solar techniques and dream analysis. Aspects of spiritual consciousness were brought to the fore and conditions ameliorated and alleviated with acoustical technologies. Much of this was based upon Pythagoras and his school of disciples, all solar adepts, that used the sacred mathematics, numerical and geometric, similar to the teachings of the Vedas, to create harmonic wave front structures, to restore emotional balance, promote the healing of body and mind, and restore the spiritual light body. The maxim was always number, that is, frequencies and geometric formations based upon the sciences of sound and vibration. And here we see a statue of Asclepius, his famous Caduceus, uh, showing the two uh, kundalini flows up the spine, I suppose you could say. And we find these same teachings, of course, in Hinduism with the entwined serpents. In all of ancient Australasia, these arts, sciences, and technologies of sonic vibrational healing were known and practiced from remote ages. The gong was the sound and symbol of the sun, the singing bowl producing the sound of consciousness experienced within, um, hu, or om, and in China, as many as five to six octaves of specially designed and tuned bells were regularly employed for healing, especially during the Confucian period, 6th century BC and forward. And here we see a sun gong from Thailand uh, used for healing. We see the singing bowls from Tibet. And in the lower uh, frame, we see the Yangzong bronze bells from the tomb of the Marquis of Yi in China. This was from the Confucian period. These bells are quite interesting as they produce two tones if they're struck on the 
rim, they produce a fundamental, and if they're struck on the side, they produce a minor and major thirds and other harmonic series for hewing. Archaeoacousticians have recently documented that the majority of ancient megalithic and temple structures were built to resonate at specific frequencies. The most common acoustical range found is from 90 to 111 hertz, the endorphin triggering range that also generally centers around 96 hertz, the resonance of the higher heart center. Ancient sites that use these endorphin resonances are found, for example, at Chichen Itza in Yucatan, Stonehenge in England. The faces of the stones, the monoliths at Stonehenge, are uh, concave on the inside so as to circulate and resonate the sound vibrations within the structure, and they're convex on the outside so as to uh, fend off any extraneous vibrations coming from the exterior. I visited New Grange in Ireland and found that the same acoustics are taking place within the chamber there. And on one of our expeditions with the Indian Explorers Foundation, uh, we've researched many ancient civilizations of the Chachapoyas in South America and in Gran Sapasoa in Peru, we found this particular structure that also has that endorphin resonance. Ancient temples, pyramids, hinges, and stone circles, kivas, caves, and the like were all built to sacred geometrical and acoustical principles, that is to alter and elevate consciousness in harmony with the teachings of the solar schools. And here we see kivas in the southwestern United States, pyramids of Egypt, a Greek temple, an Indian temple, and so forth, all built to these sacred geometrian numbers. Here we have uh, a cymatic wave form in a small dish of water. It's uh, 90 hertz in the endorphin range and it forms a uh, wonderful pattern. Uh, I've also created this many other times in eggshells with water and sound and other discs and cymatic diaphragms. You can see that the structure is a polarized cross structure vibrating, but also we have uh, some gold flecks in the water that are showing the unseen vortexes that are actually holding together. Cultures existed globally wherein uh, healing practices included light, color, use of gemstones and aromatic essences, hydrotherapy, music and sound healing, with chants and mantras, and the use of subtle energetic manipulation. One of these cultures was that of the Essenes in ancient Israel, from out of which emerged Yeshua or Jesus and the early Christians who practiced energetic healing. The branch of the Essenes in Alexandria, Egypt, worked with the Buddhist Theravadas and were called the Therapeutae, from which we obtained the word therapeutic. And here we have a nice portrait of Yeshua the Carmelite is seen from Edmund Sezekli. Qumran, Israel, home of the ancient Essenes, authors of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the community from which emerged uh, Yohannine, John the Baptist, Yeshua Jesus, Jacob, uh, James, and other early Essene therapeutic Christian healers. Nearby to the north was a stupa of Gautama's direct disciple, Thera. Therefore, these early Essene Christians were quite familiar with the teachings of Buddha, and practice many of those original vibrational healing technologies. Here's Buddha meditating from the higher heart center, of course. And here's the golden Purusha, the higher light body taught and developed by the Brahmins and earliest Hindus. Here's Kobayashi Kukai, uh, founder of Shingon Buddhism, who was also a solar adept who taught the Heart Sutra Prajna Paramita, Gate Gate Paragate, Parasam Gate Bodhi Svaha. Heraclitus of Ephesus was a solar adept who taught the concept of the solar logos and the psychic illness of Enatrodromia. Uh, Enatrodromia is a, a, a lower psychic 
condition that people can experience, and this is what they treated. All things are in flux. The flux is subject to a unifying measure or rational principle. This principle, logos, the hidden harmony behind all change, bound opposites together in a unified tension, which is like that of a lyre, where a stable harmonious sound emerges from the tension of the opposing forces that arise from the bow bound together by the string. Thus, it is quite evident that since the dawn of human history, healers have instinctively used sound, cymatic vibrational therapies, with many of these ancient practices and traditions surviving even today among numerous world cultures. However, in terms of present-day sound therapy, we are only in the initial formative stages of enlightened research and development of therapeutic vibrational technologies. Sound and vibration constitute a powerful and primal force linked with the original creative emanation in the universe cosmos. Wavefronts of sound are only lower vibrational states linked with primordial light energy and generated archetypal wavefront formations. Wavefronts are defined in physics as three-dimensional structures propagating from a common locus. If we hear a sound coming from a loudspeaker, we can imagine a series of three-dimensional spheres rapidly emanating from the cone. That is, as the sound travels, it spreads evenly, geometrically, forming rays and patterns in the air, unseen, but they are nevertheless. Wavefront bioresonance is defined as the propagation of sound waves towards or into a person, a biological form, in order to induce resonance. Like the priests and shamans of virtually all ancient civilizations, with their sacred music, chants, rattles, drums, gongs, bells, and singing bowls, modern researchers seek to find similar and perhaps even more efficacious tools for using sound and vibration and healing. A host of so-called New Age healers are utilizing tuning forks, chimes, diaphragmatic resonators, flutes, guitars, harps, mallet instruments, synthesized sounds, and musical recordings, chairs, tables, and geodesic domes with loudspeakers, along with other new and innovative, as well as traditional, devices in their healing, and in what are often respectable clinical applications of sound therapies. The understanding held in common by all of these practitioners is that sound healing is the therapeutic application of various frequencies resonances and rhythms to the corporeal, mental, and spiritual person with intent to bring that whole being into a state of improved harmony and health, proper resonance. The bodily organ most immediately responsive to sound is the human ear, which also governs a person's initial sense of balance, rhythm, and movement, and is the conductor, as it were, for the entire nervous system. Various technologies have been introduced that are used with sound in and on the ears, for example, the binaural pulsations, different tones to affect brain waves, Dr. Paul Nogier's auricular therapies, acupoint stimulation on the oracles of the external ear, and specially composed designed music. Through the medulla, the auditory nerve connects with all other parts of the body, affecting muscle tone, equilibrium, flexibility, and vision, the vagus nerve with the inner ear connections traceable to the larynx, heart, lungs, stomach, liver, bladder, kidneys, small and large intestines, at all. While it is generally believed by many, such as the followers of Dr. Alfred Tomatis, that high frequency sounds, say 3000 hertz and above, are best for activation of brain and affective cognitive functions, thinking, memory, spatial perception, focus and concentration, accumulating research indicates that it may actually be the lower or infrasonic, the extra or ultra low frequencies, that have greater potential for efficacy in healing. Regardless of the acoustical range employed, the fundamental understandings within sound therapy are that one, every object has frequencies, vibrations that are inherent to its natural 
optimal condition that all matter may be viewed as pulsations of energy from the sum atomic wave and particle levels to the larger standing wave fields and nodal formations of galaxies. Two, that energy is emitted and absorbed by virtually all energetic bodies, including human beings. And three, that the signature frequencies, signature frequencies of an object determine its function, its normal resonance, and its essential relationship to all other objects in the universe. Indeed, absent these vibrations, these pressure sound wave vibrations forming as standing wave fronts, nothing would even exist. When frequencies are out of tune, or when optimal resonance is not taking place, illness and or poor functioning is inevitable. The purpose of sound therapy is to introduce or reintroduce into the body the proper frequencies, resonances that are needed for improved physical, psychological, and spiritual functioning. In therapy, when a vibratory force is induced into the body, a locking on or entrainment takes place within a process that restores the missing order of frequencies and resonances to the systemic area, body part, or field that is, was dysfunctional. This is accomplished via natural sympathetic resonance. Organic bodies both emit and absorb frequencies. Within the infrasonic range alone, the human body emits up to 200 different frequencies. We're not openly conscious of these frequency emissions simply because they lie below the human threshold of hearing, which is approximately 20 hertz, depending upon one's age and condition of the ears. Absorbed frequencies cause the body to react and perceive in different ways. Those cycles per second lying below the range of hearing, the infrasonics, may be felt if of sufficient amplitude. But even if not sensed, such extra low frequencies are producing interactions, either positive or negative. If a sound is within the audible range, we generally tend to classify it according to our comprehensive knowledge base. Ultrasound, those frequencies lying above 20,000 Hertz, just as with infrasound, may also not be heard. But our body is responding, again, either positively or negatively. Thus, the body has innumerable vibratory patterns, centrifugal and centripetal vortexial, and dynamic functions, and there are people researching and developing all kinds of new ways of interfacing with those wave formations and affecting precise patterns and behaviors, primarily with sound, thermal waves of pressure, secondarily with electromagnetics, light and color applications, and or other vibrational healing methodologies. Now, signature frequencies is the subject. All parts of the body have signature frequencies. The nerves, the brain and its parts, the tissues and cells, the organs and glands, the DNA and RNA, the meridians, the chakras, the electrical fields and auric sheaths ad infinitum. No part is left out within this holistic conceptualization. How are these signature frequencies obtained and or determined? This is a core concern among most researchers and therapists working within the vibrational healing community. It is simply not possible to induce a proper frequency or resonance back into the body unless we know exactly what tone or chord, harmonic series or commutation has been confirmed as beneficial or optimally efficacious to begin with. Therefore, investigators study the research of others. For example, the history of acoustical science, cymatics, vibrational therapeutics, and a veritable host of related subjects found in the field of energy medicine. Some biological frequencies are rather obvious and easily measured. For example, a standard electroencephalogram can help define the numerical ranges of brain waves and their related physiological and psychological relationships. Innumerable studies, texts, and listings are available on this subject in schools, medical libraries, bookstores, and online. Similarly, there has been extensive documentation of frequency research 
and listings in other areas of medicine. A short list, by no means all-inclusive, would have to contain repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, stroboscopic stimulation, and photosyntonics, kinesiology and studies in muscle tension tetanus via electromyograms, thermography and peripheral skin temperature, galvanic skin response, numerous biofeedback technologies, cardiovascular research and electrocardiology, uh, plus the recent heart math materials, which I find quite positive, biochemistry, psychophysics, bioinformatics, electromedia and electromagnetics, binaural induction, magnetic resonance, spectroscopy, neurofeedback, acupuncture, acupressure studies, and auricular vast research, a seemingly endless list. In addition, over the last century, medical researchers have delved ever more deeply into the body, discovering and assigning frequency rates and ratios to virtually every part of the organism. Blood serum, hormones, biochemicals, cells, organs, nerves, and as we just heard with Todd, even down to the molecular level, finding the exact sine wave links uh, to modify. Nowadays, researchers speak of DNA, RNA resonances, cell wall absorption frequencies, and rates of cellular biophotonic light discharge. Of course, these latter studies and frequency listens are, unfortunately, seldom made available publicly. Then there are the frequencies, resonances, harmonics, and ratios that have been observed, sometimes documented, by researchers in acoustics and sound therapy, often via experimentation, invention, and trial and error approaches. From the end of the 18th century through the 20th, a list of prominent researchers would have to include Ernst Kladny, John Keeley, Nikola Tesla, Georges Lukowski, Royal Raymond Reif, Hans Jenny, and Harold Saxon Bird at Yale University. Some disciples of the cymatic tradition would be Drs. Vladimir Volkov, Orville Fitz, and the biochemist James Girard, among many others. Mention must also be made of the German, Manfred P. Cage, inventor of the audioscope, Margaret V. Lowenstrom, longtime researcher with the tonoscope, and the 19th century American, Margaret Watts Hughes, inventors of the idophone. Out of this tradition emerged my late colleague, Sir Dr. Peter Guy Manners, the 20th century inventor of cymatic therapy. Manners' primary contribution, aside from the thousands of successful treatments he provided to individuals seeking help, was a compilation of listings of specific frequencies, control tones he called them, or signature frequencies, and combinatorial sonic arrays, over 800 he developed, that not only have proven beneficial in healing, but may also be viewed as dynamic two- and three-dimensional forms in space, as sacred geometries, on vibrating plates, diaphragms, or in viscous fluids, gases, and or water. Contemporary scientific researchers in the specific field of sound healing are well known within the alternative medical community. Some of the more prestigious names are Terence Quickenden, Fritz Albert Popp, Kenneth J. Pienta, Donald S. Coffey, James L. Oshman, who's going to be here in Reno uh, this week, Robert O. Becker, the Indian encrinologist C. V. Krishnan, and Merrill Garnett of the Garnett McKean Laboratory. Thus, the more direct cymatic tradition continues, and therapists have multiple resources to pursue in search of specific frequencies and resonances relating to the biological and psychological well-being of human beings. Let us look at some of the more popular approaches to sound and vibrational therapy. The most common is, of course, music therapy, affecting primarily the psychological entity. Music therapy, as we know, is a well-established healthcare profession dating back over the, at least over the last century that uses music to address the physical, emotional, cognitive, and social needs of individuals of all ages. Properly chosen music can improve the quality of anyone's life and especially helpful in meeting 
the needs of children and adults with disabilities or illnesses. Interventions using music can promote overall wellness, alleviation of stress and pain, expression of feelings, the enhancement of memory, improvement of motor, social, interpersonal skills and communication, and assist in physical rehabilitation via rhythmic entrainment. Research in music therapy has a long history in the healthcare industry and within educational environments. The American Music Therapy Association, in addition to its own organization, lists over a dozen associations with their own national and international memberships in as many countries. Some instruments used for direct music therapy include harps, singing bowls, montric intonations, gong baths, and tuning forks, for example. Tuning forks are an interesting area, and I'm looking forward to hearing Eileen's presentation later today. A sounding fork in the fields can have a stimulative, relaxing, balancing, and or healing effect. In addition, the stem or handle placed upon a certain part of the body, such as an acupoint or organ, can help restore signature frequencies, assuming one knows the frequencies and the expected biological and scientific reaction to sonic induction in that area. Let us discuss these parts of the overall entity that may be affected. There is, of course, the physical third-dimensional organism with quite literally thousands of frequencies sounding as infrasonics, difference tones, harmonics, secondary and tertiary rhythms, electromagnetic and biophotonic wavefront resonances, cellular absorption ratios, hormonal and circulatory impulses ad infinitum, with all having direct and synergetic affectation upon any diagnostic acoustical perception the therapist or practitioner may experience. Here's our chart of the uh, chakras. Notice that we have eight. The link between the third dimensional physical body and the fourth dimensional fields as determined by modern biophysics and as taught by the ancient schools and texts. This is Buddha's Eightfold Path. Uh, including the double center of the heart. It's the Brahmanic Hindu Anahata being taken into account. There are eight light force centers of chakras in our system, not seven. Here's Ledbetter's chart, Powell and Ledbetter uh, to the left, and the Brennan chart to the right showing the traditional placement of the chakra uh, vortices. Here's the endocrine chakra relationships showing how each of these centers relate to the various endocrine glands. This is from the late light and color therapist Theo Gimbel, whom I believe is one of the most, uh, was one of the most knowledgeable sound and color therapists to have ever lived, showing the eight primary force centers and please note the important entry exit area as C5 and the spine directly behind the heart center. The eight fourth dimensional or psychic centers are devolved, yet dependent chakral areas of the higher fifth dimensional light body. Again, I'm talking about our system, which we call cosology. The chart to the right shows how these. Uh, Different centers relate to the higher light body and factors that can influence the different aspects of our third, fourth, and fifth dimensional being. Only a comprehensive understanding of these multiple fields and factual energetic relationships can reveal to the devoted vibrational healer exactly what is taking place within the overall entity. Now, I realize there are going to be people who disagree with this. Uh, our school has been teaching this system since 1959, and we've had quite a few good results in our healing and research. Accurate vibrational inductions may only be accomplished with a standing wave. In other words, if we're, if we're not using laser beams and we're not using advanced technologies such as uh, microdot matrices and so forth, then standard sound inductions on the body can only be accomplished really effectively with the standing wave. That is, a single tone 
frequency produced by a tuning fork, for example, or a singing bowl or a struck bell does not have sustained induction capabilities. The tone will simply vibrate momentarily, spread, and dissipate. Uh, I noticed this. I was watching Eileen's uh, video using the tuning forks, and she kept having to hit it on the, uh, I guess, hockey puck she was holding in her hand to keep it to keep the sound going. And then she, in other posts, she's asked, "Why do my tuning forks keep wearing out?" Well, metal fatigue obviously has something to do with that. Briefly, one may hear various acoustical anom anomalies, such as loudness, softness, timbre shifts, pulsations, etc., in the uh, fields above the body with a tuning fork or, or other acoustical instrument. But in order to create a standing wave that will not dissipate, a five frequency combination at minimum is required. This is basic physics and the science of synergetics developed by the late Buckminster Fuller. And I have a note there, this is why we also use chords in music, because you need multiple tones to create different tones, harmonics, and this synergetic standing wave effect. In order to build any three-dimensional structure, such as a geodesic dome or strong cymatic wave front, five frequencies are required. This is why, for example, all basic geodesic domes have at the nucleus a pentagon. A geodesic structure is incredibly strong, self-generating, and energetic in its field resonance. That is, a proper synergetic form is found in sacred geometry, for example, actually generates additional subtle energies. And here's a uh, photo of a uh, cymoglyph created here in the studio uh, demonstrating the natural five base pentagonal five frequency principle. In order to view cymatic formations, for example, on a cymoscope or in a dish of water, the sound must be contained in an enclosed area, usually on a round diaphragm or in a round dish. This is because, according to the laws of synergetics, the closest packing of spheres determines all material structuring in universe. This is analog, sinusoidal, phonon chain coherence, quite similar to what Todd was discussing earlier. Also responsible, and this is very important, these sounds are also responsible for the release of biophotons and healing. Therefore, when we place a sound in the field or on the body of a client patient, the superior sound to be applied is a combination of at least five tones. This is Dr. Manner's principle. That is, if we're truly concerned with healing the pain and suffering being addressed. In terms of acoustics, the frequencies produce different tones and harmonics, creating overall resonances while staying in place, as it were, where we put them without dissipation. Single frequencies do not have these inherent capacities. Similarly, and quite importantly, the best sound sources are analog, not digital. Digital sound dissipates, has little carrying power, and consists of nothing more substantial than sampled bit rates, not sine waves that can produce the harmonics and the difference tones. The digital signals cannot do this. And this is why we discourage the use of CDs for healing. We created many CDs over the years containing these sonations, but they weren't working. And we couldn't figure out why aren't they working. Well, because the digital signals just don't have the sustained carrying power that natural analog sounds uh, contain. Standing wave fronts are created with five frequencies. If we strum a five note chord on the harp, we will produce a far more inductive wave front than if playing single tones. Five singing bowls sounding simultaneously are harmonically more inductive than just one or two. These are very simple understandings in music, theory, pedagogy, and acoustical dynamics. Now, higher dimensional energies. When we talk about subtle energy, what are we discussing? 
Numerous physicists now tell us that the greatest sources of vital life energy, prana, chi, etc., for healing are in order. And this is uh, similar to what Claude Swanson lectures about and talks about, Carl Merritt and others. Number one is sunlight. Without the sun, we wouldn't be here. Light and color are our mainstay. We should also remember that the sun pulses. The sun gives out pressure waves, sound waves, and they're all sine waves. And therefore, the second a greatest source of this vital energy is sound. The third is air, the ether in the air. The fourth is water, preferably living water, fresh water. And the fifth source of vital life energy is sacred geometry. And this gets into Todd's emphasis on geometria. In our wavefront bioresonance research, we study sounds as cymatic formations in water. The procedure is that we take a small disk of water, a few drops, mount it on a speaker in the open air with a light shining on the water surface, usually a light ring. As we play the sounds of the disk, sacred geometric patterns are formed. This process actually employs, if you think about it, all of the above vital energies. Prana is created in and around the disk. The videos we make of these images contain all of the key energies. When viewed, even online, the images and sounds carry subtle energy fields to the viewer, and they are healing. I can't tell you how many hundreds of people have blogged on our YouTube sites and have contacted me through the email saying that they were so affected by these videos, not just on the acoustical listening level, but also on the psychological and higher field levels. Okay, so I'm going to try to show a, a YouTube video, uh, which I will use to discuss and explain what we're doing here at the Healing Center in Nevada. Now, I'm going to have to take also take down my PowerPoint here. Uh, I'm going to go to the next frame first. If anyone's interested in the subject in depth, I have two books, 530 plus pages each with hundreds of diagrams, illustrations, uh, frequency listings, case studies that uh, we have performed over the last decade. The one that I wrote in 2008 is Sauna Healing with Wavefront Bioresonance, available online. You can simply Google that title and find it. The other that I just completed in 2012 the Sonotherapy, Healing with Light, Color, Sound, Water, and Subtle Energies. And if anyone would like that, please just contact me on Facebook or email me directly at the address given. Okay, now I'm going to take down my PowerPoint. Aha. Yes, it's there. Not yet. Well done. Okay. I'm not going to try to do full screen. <laughs> Let me turn the volume down here. Okay, that was our front of our healing center. Here I am treating a, a young lady for back and shoulder pain. This area of the back is uh, one of the more important. This is my treatment room. You can see my light applicator with my Dinshaw filters and our uh, different other instruments around the room. Here's my computer set up so that I can access analog sound programs. Again, I'm treating the lady uh, on the back using a six frequency sonation for back and shoulder pain. Notice that there's light and color. Outside, we have a pool that's mounted with speakers so we can do full body inductions. This is particularly good with paraplegics and people with limited bodily motion. And of course, we include the light and color, deep tissue, aromatherapy, blah, blah. This is the acoustic foot bath in which we ask people to put their feet so we can induce sound through the bottom of the feet. Very simple uh, instrument with transducers on the bottom. This is 100 hertz, or excuse me, 10 hertz sounding in water. That's what it looks like. This is 20 hertz sounding in water where you put your feet. And here's 100 hertz sounding in water where people put their feet. 
Here are some of the applicators that we've built and designed for a different range of applications. Here we're using stereo transductions into the knees. And once again on the back, shoulders near C5, the heart center. These are the original applicators we designed back uh, when we first started this a dozen years ago here at the center. This is the original applicator we developed in uh, 2004. This is a special designed water applicator where we can just put this in a tub and get the sound into the entire body. Some more applicators developed for mid-range applications. Another water applicator, similar to the one I just showed. This is from Japan, and a small light applicator as well. This is an infrasonic applicator. Now notice the cylinder, so that we get the longer wavelengths. Uh, my original text of codes I published in 2006. This is a new unit that has just been perfected. People are ordering this now from uh, my friend Adam Reed. It produces pure analog sound, accurate to within four decimal places each frequency, can be pulsed at infrasonic rates. Okay, so we have found that these sound combinations can help with all kinds of uh, conditions. Here they are, a lot of them, most of them. I have a dentist friend who is now anxious to get the new unit and began using the sonations in his dentistry practice. We can remove scar tissue, very importantly. Scar tissue is one of the biggest problems people have. We can work on varicose veins, ladies. Okay, now here's the studio uh, where I work, where I'm sitting right now. I have a computer with a sound program to produce analog sounds. Here is that program. I'm turning it on. This is a Sonotion acidosis based upon Dr. Manners and Paul Nogier's rates. Here's the video screen showing the light ring in the small dish of water. Here's the cymatic geometry that's formed as a result of this particular sonation. Notice it's pentagonal, five frequency combination. And here's the camera where I record all of these to make my YouTube videos for healing. And of course, we archive these and use them in therapies. I often have my clients watch the videos while I'm using the sounds, and this helps them focus the energies where they're needed. These are some of the clips of cymatic formations we've archived. 54 hertz to pitch A. An a, oct a an octave higher, 216 hertz, A another octave higher. And this is 432 hertz. We have a good video online about 432 hertz. This is the best concert tuning to achieve wave fronts. Here's the golden mean, 161.8 hertz sounding simultaneously. It's just A pentatony. It's A, B, C sharp, E, and F sharp using what we call pulse tone tunings based on that 432 hertz principle. This is a sonation for detoxification, quite effective. We can de 
detoxify uh, many of the organs and glands, especially the liver. This is the etheric field sonation, which we use uh, all over the body for the one to two inch envelope around the body. This is for asthma, best applied at C5 on the back, again at the heart center, but also for the lungs. This is a sonation magi that we use for reading the fields. If I use an orange and lime filter, pulsing the sound and light together, we can actually see and feel the fields and hear them as well, of course. This is Accuresonance, one of my favorites. This is good for the acupoints and meridians, the bog and ducks, clearing blockages. This is for inflammation. One of the leading causes of illness, of course, is inflammation. So if we have swelling and inflammation, this will help remove that within two or three minutes. This is for muscle stiffness. It uh, helps balance the calcium and magnesium ions in the muscles so that we can relieve muscle stiffness quite effectively. Obviously, we can classify these formations into categories for muscles and cells and so forth. This is the popular 132 hertz sophagio tone of uh, Paleo and Horowitz and so forth. Okay, now this is a, an actual session. Leon Baum, uh, Leon Baum, one of our therapists, is treating a lady and consulting with her. This is using the acoustic foot bath with the transducers below the feet for uh, ankle swelling and general neurology in the feet. Here she's using the water applicator on the knee for the meniscus. Here she's using that same applicator in the water, in the water around the ankles to make sure that the sounds are getting into those areas. And uh, she's using the sonation etheric field. Once again, she has her hand on one side of the knee so she can feel the vibrations coming through the entire meniscus to make sure that complete induction and entrainment has taken place. This will help strengthen the, the meniscus and so forth. Okay, now here's another client. Notice that we're using music that's composed to the exact frequencies of the sonation being applied. I have to tune the uh, frequencies very precisely so that the music, the rhythm, the sonations are all working together. We're pulsing the colored light with the sonation in complete synchronicity. The light is creating cymatic and synergetic feels with the sound. A steady beam will not do that. You have to have the pulsing of the sound with the light to achieve that. little reflexology here. Here we're working on a bronchial congestion and inflammation. client is also receiving specific color and vibration in the eyes. This is photosyntonics, quite effective in stimulating the midbrain, the 12 cranial nerves, strengthening the pineal, as Todd was discussing. And here's the same client on the table. Use two 45 watt transducers applied in panned stereo. We're 
remember this is the lady with the bronchitis. Not the pulsing colored light on the chest and in the eyes. Also notice that we're quite gentle with our clients and there are obviously psychological and spiritual energies being shared, but I won't get into all of that. Okay, now we're reading the fields using that Magi sonation with the orange and lime filters, the best wavelengths for reading the fields, by the way. We can hear soft, loud, different tampers, distortions in the field as we move the applicators back and forth around the body. The chakras are not necessarily sending out specific rays up in the air above the body. We have to understand that we have many fields and many vibrations in the field uh, to be studied and listened for. Once we find a, an area where the sound, for example, might be too soft, then we give that spot extra energy. We spiral down clockwise, apply the energy, spiral out counterclockwise, and then we secure the area by uh, creating a polarized cross field above it. One, two, three applications on an area, and we can clear it and strengthen it. Back to the feet, the distal areas of the feet are key to the entire persona, the open neurological, organic, and meridional nadi channels. And this ties into all the writings, particularly by James Oshman, on grounding, earthing, receiving the negative ion flows from the earth to balance the solar energies, yang, that are in the environment. We can easily feel and see these enveloping sheaths around the body while we're treating people. We, there's no woo-woo or psychological uh, thing going on here. We can actually hear and see the feels. So the applicators near the body, we're hearing the etheric field. As she raises the applicator, they get soft, as she goes up, we hear the second field. So we're seeing a distinction between the etheric and causal envelopes. Now, this is the other client. We're treating eye conditions here, namely cataracts. This lady had developing cataracts and we removed them. Six weeks. Okay, I guess it's about time for me to stop, so I will stop. If I can. There we go. Okay, so we'll close that and I'm back online and Eileen's ready to go. 
<laughs> wow, that was fantastic. Um, Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. We uh, obviously would love to join everybody on um, the group to address questions and uh, so if there is something that we through, we have to just move on with the program and you can send them in and we can discuss them on the group on Energy Medicine Exchange, which is on Facebook, so join us there and just discuss any questions you might have for Gary or the previous uh, speaker. Todd, Todd, and just shoot those questions out, and we try to get them answered. So we have I, our I, next guest. Just one minute, Lydia. I just would like to, to really extend a special thank you to Gary. Um, that really was a visit to the um, the clinic of the future. I can imagine. Um, Every community equipping itself with, uh, with somebody trained by the likes of Gary and Todd and Eileen and uh, really extending you know, impossible things in current medicine to our community. And uh, I know Gary's got a big conference next weekend in Reno, Nevada. I've just re I've just dragged his post up from the depths on EME. So if you've uh, got some Southwest Airlines, now's the time to use them. 